Hi, in this lecture we're going to talk about the prophets in both Israel and Judah. Uh, we'll begin with uh, five questions. Those questions are, what is a prophet? What is the prophetic experience? What are the types of prophets? What is the prophetic message? And what is the modern relevance of the prophets? So these will be our five sections to this presentation. So let's begin with, what is a prophet? Uh, if I were to ask you, what is a biblical prophet, and had you uh, write down the list. Most commonly, I find that I get answers like uh, someone who tells us the future, someone who condemns uh, people's actions, uh, somebody who threatens. It's usually a fairly negative view of prophets, and it's usually focused on what might be called the fortune teller uh, role of a prophet. Actually, uh, prophet is, uh, comes from the Greek word prophetes, which means to speak before. Um, but in Hebrew tradition, the word comes from nabi or navi, that b there can be, has sort of a b sound to it, which means one who calls out or one who is called. And notice in the uh, Hebraic word, uh, it has this two movements. One is to be called out, uh, you know, calling the people out of what they're doing now to something else. So that's what, you know, in that sense, drawing them forth. Um, while uh, another one is, the other kind of meaning of the word would re refer more to the, uh, the prophet, him or herself, the one who is uh, called. Uh, other titles, you can see uh, seer or visionary, um, which we'll talk about that later might have re uh, the relationship to the divinization side of Israelite prophecy. Uh, other words used for prophets are man of God or sons of the prophets. Um, we can well imagine, and there's good evidence for, that prophets weren't these isolated guys out there on the fringes. They actually were leaders of schools uh, or guilds. So uh, that's where this idea of the sons of the prophets, you know, that there's sort of a, a, a family, if you will, a collection of, of like-minded folks who are working together to achieve a common vision of uh, the coming of God's reign within the world. Uh, the key thing is that a prophet is not a fortune teller, but rather, a, what I like to say, a, a forth teller. He calls forth the people. Uh, if you look down at the bottom part, they don't predict the future, but rather they announce the future. So basically, it's sort of a natural consequences sort of uh, role. Look, the way we're going, this is what's going to happen as a result. Um, and, you know, a parent does this all the time, right? You can say to your child, uh, if you don't eat your peas, you know, you won't be strong. Um, that's not because you're a prophet. You just know the natural consequences of a good balanced diet in relationship to physical strength. So... Uh, that's what a prophet does. He understands God's ways and so therefore is able to articulate for the people the uh, problems which will occur if they don't conform themselves to those ways. Um, so we might define a prophet as a person who serves as a channel of communication between the human and divine by means of an uh, intuitive uh, divinization versus inductive, which we'll talk about in a moment, the distinction there. The goal of the prophet is to extrapolate from current state of affairs into the future based on the knowledge of what God demands. Right? So let's move to our second topic. What is the prophetic experience? Um, first thing to note is that prophecy was a well-known phenomenon, social uh, role within the ancient Near East. Scholars, biblical scholars, used to say that uh, you only saw prophetic uh, traditions within the biblical text within Israel and Judah. Uh, but uh, as we've uncovered through archaeology of the text, it's clear that this is not a unique or distinctive uh, social phenomenon. Uh, so, for example, if we look at the text we uncovered from the 18th century in Mari, which, as you can see from the map, is uh, in southern uh, Assyria, because uh, this whole area right here gets going. This is Assyria right here, modern-day Iraq, um, and then Syria, kind of on that area right there. Um, we find the, in these tablets descriptions of uh, 
people who have these revelations through dreams, usually when they're in some sort of a static state, or when they're in the temples, they have these revelations. Um, the, the focus of these revelations that come through dreams is to proclaim the success or danger to the king, to warn about cultic neglect, or to call for the doing of justice. And those are the, uh, the three main themes we see within the prophetic tradition in the Bible. Uh, and uh, we will also see uh, prophets who receive their, um, their visions through dreams uh, or in an ecstatic state, and also as they're in the temple. Um, Isaiah being a good example, he sees in chapter 6 of Isaiah a vision of, the, of, the, of God, and uh, as he talks to his retinue there in, in the heavenly hosts. Um, so both the type of uh, revelations and in terms of the content of the revelations, there's a number of similarities here. Also, the number of titles for these, these folks that have these revelations, uh, answerer, ecstatic, but also a Nabu, or Nabu, which is a cognate, since both uh, the uh, Assyrian language uh, as well as uh, Hebrew are Semitic languages. They have similar terminology, just like the Romance languages do today, let's say, uh, between uh, uh, Italian and uh, Spanish, for example. You have some similar vocabulary. As well as you know, within English, we have the same thing with other languages. So clearly, there's a relationship between these, not just even the uh, social function, but also the terminology. Uh, another example is comes. This comes from the 12th century text, so the 1100s, uh, from Egypt. So the other great river civilization on uh, down here in the south, of Israel and Judah. Um, and even though this text is found in uh, uh, e Egypt, it's a story that takes place actually in the area of the of Syria, uh, up by Damascus, uh, up here in Byblos. Uh, and it's a story of the or a tell of when Ammon when Ammon travels from uh, uh, Egypt to go up to uh, this part of the the world, and there he meets this charismatic prophet from Byblos. And um, the uh, so, uh, um, and here I actually show you the text where this is told. What's sort of interesting is, <clears throat> by the way, a couple things interesting here. Um, the text is both in uh, hieroglyphics as was hieratic text. So you can see the language moving from um, uh, these uh, objects the drawing of objects into a letter form. Um, in fact, if you look at Hebrew, it's speculated that um, some of the letters were originally objects like this that then get transformed into letter form. Um, all right, so um, yeah, so here we have from Egypt, another story of a prophet. Um, then we can go to Assyria which is, uh, well, Mar here is in the south, but here is Syria more um, around its capital, Nineveh. And this is another example of an Assyrian text. Uh, this is uh, from the 7th century, though, so much more contemporaneous with the biblical traditions of most of our prophets in the Bible come from the 8th, 7th, 6th, and uh, 5th centuries. Um, and the number of Assyrian texts I'll give you one example to the right, which we'll talk about in a minute. But again, much like the biblical text, they provide assurance of, of divine support during a crisis, um, as presented through the words of a, of a, of a god or goddess. Uh, these also are preserved on tablets, very close in some sense of an analogy to our biblical text. Um, and the titles used is that the, the prophet is an ecstatic or a proclaimer. Uh, I give you one example of a, this is not one of the um, tablets, but rather an example of a prophetic, um, uh, of a prophet guiding the king is, in, is on the Zakur stela, which was found in Damascus. So Damascus is over here, and so we will, we will remember from our history that uh, Assyria is dominating the uh, ancient Near East at this point and its, its power is extending down here to Damascus 
and in the um, this period, the seventh century, they've actually conquered um, Israel to the north, the country to the north. Um, and so, what do we hear? And of course, once they control the area, they leave other kings in charge, and from time to time, they have to deal with rebellions. So here we have um, a stela that a king put up uh, over here in Damascus that's recounting his victory uh, once he there was a rebellion and he put it down. And so he says, I am Zakur, king of Hamath, and uh, Luash, uh, Bar Hadad, son of Hazael, and king of Aram. Aram, that would be Assyria, not a name for Syria. So this is telling about the victory he had over Syria. Um, united it against me 17 kings. All these, so we can imagine other vassals. All these kings laid sage, uh, siege, I'm sorry, to Hazarach and Baal Shammayan said to me, and that's the name of the prophet. Baal is, you know, a name of a god. Baal, the Lord of Thunder. So here's a prophet with a god's name at the front end of his title or his name. Said to me, "Do not be <coughs> excuse me. Do not be afraid. I will save you from all these kings who have besieged you." So we will see this in the biblical text. Uh, many prophets speak to the kings related to foreign threats, uh, military threats, and how they should respond to those. Oh, um, so same context and, and a similar kind of function. All right, now let's talk about the distinction between inductive and intuitive divinization. Now inductive, which is also called instrumental divinization or just sometimes just divinization or, or maybe more derogatorily, sorcery. Um, it's an attempt to discern the will of God by examining, uh, by external observation. So one common method was that you sacrificed some sort of animal, uh, maybe a pigeon or what have you, and then you would examine the entrails, particularly the liver. And this might give you insight about the will of the gods that's present in the liver. Or you might look at the flight of birds in the air, and that might uh, give you some insight. Or maybe you cast lots. You take sticks or what have you and different or bones and you would throw them down and uh, that would tell you what God's will is. Um, now we do similar things uh, today I would say. Um, you know you can imagine the um, in some ways the, the um, uh, horoscopes in the newspaper are an example of reading the stars, right? External observation, how the stars move, tells you what's your destiny today. Um, we don't probably look at livers anymore or flights of birds, but I actually think most people, um, it's really through inductive uh, divinization that they come to understand the will of God, you know? So uh, they look at what's happening around them, the, 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 the signs of their life and the lives of others and see how God is operating or not. So we shouldn't dismiss or disparage uh, inductive divinization very quickly because in fact uh, we, it takes different forms but we would all agree that God's will is being operated in the world and this is the point um, of the uh, of using these different methods in the ancient world was well God's active in the world it, it, the effects of his action must be somehow uh, discernible. Now we may not agree with the means, whether that's the uh, examining the liver, but we certainly accept the principle. Um, and by the way, why would you look at the flight of birds? Well, because uh, those birds are uh, connecting heaven and earth, right? They live on earth, but they also ascend, ascend to the heavens, so they must be more connected to God, revealed. Why examine the liver? Well, you've killed the animal. The animal itself is in this, has just moved from the one state, the present world, into the next state, um, into the, uh, that great abyss. And so, and the liver um, uh, was a, seen as a sort of this, um, uh, what is that for? <laughs> What's the purpose of a liver? Right? You can understand the purpose of a heart, um, and when it stops beating, the effect thereof. But a liver? Uh, so it must be, you know, have some special function of this connection between this world and the nether world. Um, and of course, it's rich with vitamins and what have you. Um, still today, you know the value of eating liver. 
um, casting bones. Well, again, uh, you know, bones of animals. That's of us, an animal who's passed away. So this connection, looking for things that connect us from this world to the to the to the supernatural. Now, when we're talking, oh, by the way, uh, this is basically a priestly function. So when we see this kind of inductive divinization happening. Uh, it's usually performed by priests, you know, so you offer sacrifice of the animal and then read the liver or what have you. Um, so that means it's done within a temple context or in the ancient Near East. Um, intuitive divinization um, is different. It's also called mediated divinization or just prophecy. Um, here it's probably what we more typically think about in terms of, of prophecy. Uh, it's uh, revelations received through uh, visions or dreams, as, or sometimes by direct revelation, uh, and sometimes in a state of ecstasy, you know, um, the person goes into a trance or what have you. Um, in the biblical text, we see prophets dancing, so getting themselves in this sort of ecstatic state to experience the, uh, the vision, to come to this inspiration. So here we're thinking uh, about uh, prophecy, which or what's called intuitive divinization, as it's it's intuitive, right? It's instead of inductive, where I look at the facts around me and make some assessment of the meaning of those facts. Intuitive means it just sort of comes to me uh, instantaneously or directly um, uh, through some non-physical means, visions, dreams, right? Um, these come through, if you will, my my brain. Uh, through an internal process, not through an external one. All right, and this is really what we're talking about when we talk about, in the biblical tradition, of prophet, the prophetic function. Uh, this is what prophets do. Um, now, we do have, there's a few uh, places where you can get a sense that uh, the prophets allude to inductive um, divinization, but it's primarily through this induct intuitive means that the prophets receive their revelation. All right, uh, I'm just kind of here to give you some examples of inductive divinization, the reading of, of liver omens. Uh, and again, as I said, we have some allusions to this in the biblical text. You can see that in Ezekiel 21, 21. Uh, oh, conjuring up the dead. You know, the, the uh, we have this, the, your seance. <laughs> um, remember, at least when I grew up, you had the Ouija board. You know, uh, that was sort of another way of uh, interpreting what some hidden truth, but also, you know, you can talk about the seance, which was uh, uh, a way of connecting to the people who passed away. And we see, again, a biblical example that Saul conjures up Samuel at Endor. Um, where did we just read that recently? Uh, casting of lots, the Thuman and Ermin that, they, that the priests use, you know, that uh, alluded to a number of times, seemed to be this kind of device to read the thought, the, the, the signs of the times. And we have a lot of examples of that. The reading of stars, uh, we see that in Isaiah 47. Uh, another way people would interpret the uh, future is to pour oil on water and look for patterns within that. And, and that seems to be what's going on in Genesis 44. And we also talked about the ob observing the flight of birds. Here I give you some examples to the left. Here's liver models of, from Hazor. Or Hazor. Um, so basically, well, if I open up the liver of a of a pigeon or a dove, how do I know what that means? Well, they make clay models to say, well, if it looks like this, this is what it means. If it looks like this, this is what it means. Um, and then here we have a reconstructed possible reconstruction. We don't really know what the Thuman and Ermin look like. But this is an attempt to kind of capture that, and these are uh, bones that would be that we were dug up. And so these two are actually historically, uh, archaeologically recovered. Uh, these are reconstructed assessment uh, kind of guesses. But this right here um, would was a bone that was understood from the archaeological context to be used for this purpose of an inductive divinization. All right, so the normative prophetic experience, what is that? Um, first off, we say there isn't a normative you know, prophetic experience per se. There's not one prophetic experience. Uh, some have a call vision, you know, where they're 
they're told, hey, you're the one, now here's what you should do. You know, um, you can think of a couple of examples of that, uh, where people have this, this calling, this uh, yeah, narrative. Uh, but others don't. Most don't have a call narrative incorporated within the biblical text. Uh, some just preach through oracles, thus says the Lord. Uh, kind of a way of communicating their revelations. Others use prophetic actions. Uh, some stress social justice, while others are focused on reforming worship. Uh, one, So we have a lot of variation. I think that's important because I think sometimes people narrow down the nature of biblical prophecy within uh, prophetic traditions within the Bible. Uh, but that said, one thing that seemed to be fairly clear is that they all seem pretty well educated people who are primarily challenging the powerful and the privileged in society. Um, you could, you know, there's some question about the education level of some of the prophets, but uh, uh, I think on the whole, we'll see that they, they seem to come from uh, not the poor per se, but the, the educated, privileged class. So they're actually criticizing people within their own community and their own social status um, somewhat uh, significantly. All right, so um, if we were to kind of summarize this common prophetic function, again, uh, a generalization. Each book has its own nuance, but you can say that they analyze the contemporary political and social policies in light of Yahweh's demands for justice, worship, and faithfulness. That's what they do. That's the prophetic function. That's not a bad sort of nutshell description. Um, and the presupposition is that faith is integrally Political. That doesn't mean religious institutions are integrally political, but that faith itself calls us to engage uh, the world in some concrete manner to make the world better, to uh, move it in a, a more faithful direction. And that means, um, and so I'm taking po political here to mean it, it has consequences in how we organize ourselves and, uh, and even govern ourselves. Uh, Walking through the biblical prophetic period, we're, now here we're talking about the uh, uh, the prophetic books, and we can date these books between 750 to 450. Uh, B, uh, uh, I'm sorry, that should, should be BCE, not CE. My uh, left out the B's. <laughs> so uh, before or BC. So this is uh, Old Testament period, obviously 750 to 450 BCE. And, you know, we've been looking at the major powers that dominate the region uh, during this time. And this should be getting familiar to us. So we have the Assyrian period, where they're the dominant uh, nation. And then, of course, they're uh, uh, succeeded by the Babylonians when they begin to take control. And, of course, it's in the Babylonian period. It actually was a fairly brief period, but this is the time of the exile. The Babylonians take the people of Judah into exile. The Assyrians, the people of Israel, they've taken their leaders into exile and they disappear. But in the Babylonian period, we have the people of Judah being conquered and put into exile. And then we have the Persian period, modern day Iran, and that's when the people are restored. The people of Judah are allowed to return and rebuild the temple. Now, so in that framework, we can take a look at the biblical prophets. From the 750 to 700 period, we have Amos, Hosea, First Isaiah, because most biblical scholars will claim that Isaiah is a com um, compilation of uh, scrolls of, of, from different periods of time. It's, it's not from just one period of time. It comes from three different periods of time. Um, so the first 39 chapters would be First Isaiah, although even within 1 to 39, there seems to have been some interjection of some um, some traditions from a, a later period of time. And then also Micah. So that's this period of time um, before the destruction of Israel. Then you have this period of time from 650, so the nation of Israel, you know, is defeated in 722. Um, and so this period, these books are either uh, before that destruction or, or right contemporaneous with it. In you know, First Isaiah's example, Sennacherib de defeats uh, the northern kingdom, and then um, Sennacherib is coming towards Jerusalem. We have a number of 
prophetic words uh, from in First Isaiah uh, relating to that challenging moment. Then you have uh, the period from 650 to 555. And this is during the time where the balance of power is shifting from the Assyrians to Babylonians. It's very interesting that you get a very active period of time, at least with, in terms of what's retained within the biblical text. You have Zephaniah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, all active in this period of time. Now, Ezekiel, um, he actually, um, is a text, it, from the, exil from the exile itself. It's being constructed during the exile. Um, the prophet of the exile, in exile. And then you have uh, the post-exilic period, uh, or the, and this is 550 to 500. Obadiah, 2nd Isaiah. And 2nd Isaiah seems to be written after the Babylonians have defeated Assyria, or at least they're on the march to defeating the Assyrians. And so it's written in that context of anticipating that the Babylonians will be victorious. And you have Third Isaiah, which was written after the people have come back from exile. So, so in some sense, um, you have First Isaiah before the exile, Second Isaiah right at the uh, tail end of the exile, and Third Isaiah during the post-exilic period after the restoration back to the land. And you have Haggai, who you read for today, and then Zechariah. Uh, then after 500, you have Malachi, which was an optional reading for you to read. Because um, I want to give you a chance. I, most of you have uh, uh, Jeremiah and Ezekiel to read for your exegetical field reports, as well as um, some of you had uh, a passage from 2nd Isaiah. So you had this um, you know, exposure to a prophet from the pre-exilic period right before the Babylonian exile, and then one who was operant during the exile, uh, the tail end. But then you have these prophets who are writing after the restoration and kind of dealing with um, the, the Persian period more directly, more kind of full-throatedly in that period. We have Malachi, Joel, and Jonah. Of course, we read with McKinsey about Jonah, it's a very unique text. It's almost an anti-prophet in terms of how it's presented. It's a sort of a self-criticism within the prophetic books about the, how prophecy can go sort of awry if it's not properly ordered. Um, so I make this comment that the most active periods were in times of transition on either side of the, uh, of the exile. Uh, here's a link if you wanted to type that in. It's a nice link on the... Um, kind of walks you through the different phases of the world history um, in a very quick, I think it's 90 seconds, uh, kind of the different rise and falls of the different empires of the, of the ancient world. So now we'll move on to the different types of prophets. Um, so one thing to note is that there are really three, within the biblical text, three distinct types of prophets. There's court prophets, cult prophets, and social prophets. Most people's image of a prophet is a, that of a social prophet, prophet, the sort of lone ranger out on the fringes of society, you know, maybe like John the Baptist eating milk or, uh, locusts and honey. Um, but in fact, I think um, that's even those social prophets were part of a social group. They had disciples who followed them. And uh, again, you can imagine them to be um, not just sort of these radical fringe, but actually being pretty well uh, integrated within society and hence um, being well educated, hence addressing a reality they know. But we shouldn't pass so quickly through the other two types of prophets. So court prophets are prophets who worked in the king, you know, in the king's court, uh, gave him advice, gave him direction, gave him a, some uh, understanding of how God might be calling him to, to act. Very important. We see the number of these. We've seen this within uh, already we saw Nathan. You know, Nathan is a court prophet, um, and uh, so these different types of prophets not only appear within the narrative, you know, but um, uh, but also we hear some of their words, right? And then we have cult prophets, and here within the biblical text we have some clear examples of, of uh, some cult prophets. So uh, Isaiah's uh, actually Isaiah could be a court prophet, um, 
And, but he's also, he has his vision within the temple. He might be a cult prophet. So it's hard to kind of pin down Isaiah, which one of these two types does he fit into. Um, but we have clearly some other uh, cult prophets. You know, you read about Haggai. Well, we can imagine Haggai is a cult prophet. So these are basically people in the, what do we mean by that? They're in the temple context, at least within uh, uh, the, pe- the faith of the people of, of uh, Israel and Judah. Uh, we're talking about it being in the temples or the holy shrines. Um, so these are people who are enmeshed within a religious context and speaking in that context. Uh, Ezekiel's another example. Ezekiel was clearly a priest uh, who spoke uh, in a prophetic way. So, and of course we saw already how the some of the inductive prophetic traditions um, were located within the cult context. And this continued, and not just in terms of inductive uh, prophecy, but also um, through uh, inductive prophecy as well in the in the religious context, the temple. And then we do have these social prophets. These seem to be folks who are, you know, they're they're rising up not out of the court per se or the cult, but out of the needs of the population at large. Some of them may well have, you know initiated their their uh, careers in the court or the cult but now they've moved sort of out of those social contexts um, and uh, are operating again I think we should see that in a group context but sort of um, that in terms of they're probably gathering disciples but that they're somehow distinct from these other two social contexts of court and cult so we've already seen that we've seen this a number of times we've divided the Old Testament one traditional way of doing that is into the Torah, Pentateuch, prophets, and writings. But we're going to drill down and and break this out a little bit. What's in this basket? So uh, first off, when we talk about prophetic literature, um, if you use that tripartite division of the Old Testament, then you would break out the prophetic, the prophets, into two other subsets. The what are called the former prophets and the latter prophets. That's the uh, uh, traditional language for these two different groups. What are the former prophets? Well, these are people that don't have their own books, all right? So that's one way to think about it. They're also earlier. But uh, Elijah and Elisha would be a good example. There's extensive discussion of their uh, uh, ministry and their careers in 1 and 2 Kings, but they don't have their own prophetic books. So, and then we see a number of former prophets within the Deuteronomistic literature, so that's really where they are located at, is in, uh, well, Moses is seen as a prophet, but also we see prophets rising up in Judges and then 1 and 2 Samuel as well. So that's the former prophet group, and then we have the latter prophets, and these are people that have their own books, so in the biblical uh, canon. So we have Isaiah, who we've talked about, and Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. These are, we'll mention in a moment, the three major prophets. And then we have what's called the Book of the Twelve. Um, so a scroll could only hold so much material, which we'll see in a moment. And uh, if you put all these guys together, you'll see the length of that collection is about the same as the length of this, of Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. All right? So therefore... Um, the theory is that you had the Book of the Twelve, which would have been uh, one book, one scroll, but it had 12 different uh, prophetic texts within it. So sort of 12 chapters of one book. So uh, so we basically, in, originally, we can say there were four prophetic books, four different scrolls, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the Book of the Twelve. All right. Uh, so major, by the way, does not mean they're more important. Now, I guess because of the length of their work, you could make that argument, but it's meant more to represent the length of their work, that it, they have their own book, versus minor prophets simply mean that their uh, con- their work is contained within this larger book of the Twelve. So major, minor, even though clearly uh, they have the major prophets have some ways more impact upon the tradition, it's not trying to say their work is more important than the minor prophets. You know, Amos, Hosea, uh, Micah, in particular, these three prophets have a fairly significant impact upon 
the uh, religious traditions. Um, all right. You notice that Daniel's not included in this collection. Tra traditionally, he was. He was uh, labeled as a prophet. Um, but if you look at the literary form, it's actually closer to apocalyptic literature, which we'll talk about at a later date. And so, uh, from a literary genre perspective, he's not a prophet, uh, but rather his text is apocalyptic literature. And so, scholars today don't um, categorize Daniel in the, in the category of, prof of prophetic literature. Uh, what is the prophetic message? All right. So, uh, this is a kind of classic uh, articulation of some of the major themes within prophetic literature. Now, I personally would want to say there's some uh, limitations to this list because we see other themes that rise to the fore that could you could easily justify a, if you're trying to make a top three uh, list, you could add or subtract other uh, themes. But this is, I'd say, the dominant sort of uh, understanding of the prophetic message in a nutshell. So the first one is about God's plan in history, his, uh, his work within history, that God says here, God's power is such that it all lies under his control, including destin destinies of the mighty nations who are instruments of his policy, and that all human plans are, failed to, uh, to, are, are doomed to fail if you don't trust Yahweh's help and protection. Um, so this theme of God's action in history and the need to trust God in order to be protected by God is a major theme. Not in every book, but in a number of books and certainly a major theme within the prophetic uh, corpus. Then the condemnation, condemnation of pride. Uh, this is the source of injustice, immorality, and improper worship because it is in contradistinction to faith. That pride puts yourself in the wrong position relative to God, and so therefore it brings judgment. And then social justice, uh, oppression of weaker members of the society. This offends God's holiness and his justice. And uh, there's a sense that we all suffer from everybody else's actions. So this corporate sense of punishment is very clear within the biblical tradition. Um, and it's upholding this sense that we're fundamentally bound together. And so therefore our destiny is bound together. Uh, that a very communitarian perspective of the nature of God's actions in the world. Uh, what I give you here is a study that was done a little over 10 years ago. Uh, Uni Baylor University did a, a very extensive study on American uh, society, uh, population's views towards faith and uh, and, uh, and uh, views of God, a number of factors within the faith life of, of Americans. They called the Baylor study on American piety. Um, they had one rather, you know, one of their meta conclusions is in, that they assessed was that pe they put uh, people's faith onto this continuum, this chart, uh, as you can see in the y-axis. I believe the y is vertical, right? Um, that how much do people believe that God's engaged with daily life? And you can see at the bottom it's low up to high. People you know, think God's barely involved with daily life to a very high degree of belief that God's involved with daily life. And then how angry is God? <laughs> or how much does God, uh, do you see God as a punishing God? If you see God, and I, I have a little problem with that language there at the bottom one, but all the same. Um, if you had a view that God's very punishing, then, you know, it's to the far right, looking at the x-axis, or no, you didn't think God was focused so much on anger or punishment, but maybe mercy and, and love, then it'd be to the left. So you see in the bubbles, um, is this they identified four different views of God in terms of where people fell within these continuums. They put them within these groupings. And so if they are low on believing God's engagement with life and low on God's anger, people... Here had a view of a distant God. Interesting, with general population, that's 24%. Catholic population, that's 29%. So a higher representation here. And again, this is where I'm, um, you know, because, uh, so I, I guess the argument would be made that if you have a view that God's less angry, you have a, you emphasize God's love over God's uh, punishment. 
Um, and then if we continue to the um, uh, to the above that, you can see if we continue along the believe God's engagement with daily life, well, um, if we move up the ladder, you can see that the general population have a benevolent view of God, 23%. So they, they think God's really involved um, and, and pretty loving, and that's 28% of the Catholic population. So over half the Catholic population is on this side of the spectrum. And again, I have complaints about just using the word angry versus you know, some other language that might be more effective to say that basically Catholics have a more benevolent, loving view of God, and the, um, they're kind of on this continuum related to how active they see God in their lives. If we go on the other, uh, the other way, you can see that while on the, on the left-hand side, Catholics sort of outperform <laughs> the general population. As we move on the angry side, um, then the general population generally pretty much is more pessimistic, except for the bottom one, where we have pretty much the same. The general population see God as not being very engaged with life and being pretty angry. General population 16%, Catholic population 18%. But here's sort of remarkable uh, in terms of the disparity, almost a 10-point gap, at least a 9-point gap. Um, the general population, 31%, so this is in the general population, this is the dominant view of God, is that God's highly involved. So about a third of the population sees God as highly involved with daily life and highly angry and punishing. Um, and yet within the Catholic frame, that's the, oh, uh, the third most popular view. So you really see, it's quite interesting to see this uh, distinction between the Catholic understanding of God and the general population's view of God. Catholics much more focused on um, God's uh, love, with the modern language, um, versus his anger or punishment. Um, and and you know, generally see God as being fairly involved in some form or fashion, although you know, also, uh, in some ways there's also sort of a disengagement with God, which surprises me. I mean, given our sacramental view of, of God, the God and you know, intertwined within the natural world, and that's my, another one of my questions about this study is Catholics might articulate the presence of God within the world in more sacramental terms. And I don't know, coming out of Baylor um, University, you know, do they are, um, capture that language as representing a, a, a sense of God as being very present within the created order of things? Or did they not understand that sacramental sort of understanding or articulation of God activity? I, I don't know. But um, as I looked at the study, and their questions they ask, they really don't probe any kind of sacramental sense of God. So I, I think that's probably a, a, one of the limitations of the study. But all the same, this is interesting because I think we might say that the prophets would clearly fall into the line with seeing God as very engaged with daily life, at least within history, right? And uh, I think the popular imagination is that God, that the prophetic God is very angry, very punishing. I don't know if that's accurate. I think God is also very correcting, parental within um, the prophetic text, trying to recalibrate the people in line with him. But I would agree that on the whole, you do get a fairly uh, stern God within the uh, prophetic literature. So, um, uh, so again, you might the, the if you put the prophetic books on this graph, you know, where would they fall? Well, probably more on in towards that authoritarian God sort of perspective, although, again, I want to nuance that to some degree. Of course, this is what I've given you, another way to think about the nature of God. We looked at the theodolite um, uh, method for kind of articulating uh, God and assessing God, uh, the different biblical texts in light of uh, God's work, uh, or in light of the biblical text portrayal of God. Um, and I give you these other kind of continuum. Um, the thing I'd like to stress is, and we could you know use this graph to analyze every book, prophetic book, um, but I like to point that the big theme within uh, prophetic literature is has said this a sense of love, um, and uh, if I'd like to argue. <laughs> That love's right there in the center. It's, it's, justice and holiness meet 
in love. Righteousness and compassion meet in love. Um, and so therefore, that's one of my maybe critiques, if you will, of the uh, Baylor study is that the continuums are wrong. It's, it's articulated only in terms of anger and distance, um, not in terms of maybe some other binary uh, terminology that might be more helpful. Um, all right. Uh, you've been noticing we've been using this uh, these slides. Here I just make note that the reason I picked this background for these slides is the obviously the scales, the scales of justice, since that's a major theme within the biblical tradition. Um, but then it is this idea of weighing. You know, that's what discernment is, is weighing uh, the pro to try to get to the proper balance of things. And that's what the prophetic tradition does. Um, how do the different uh, prophets communicate what they are, what their revelation is? Well, they can use words like oracles, thus says the Lord. They can uh, have a vision and report it. Here's what I had this vision, here's what I uh, saw. Um, they can use word plays, we're going to see that, sort of puns and uh, kind of creative ways to uh, capture the imagination through word plays. Uh, you can have narratives, stories, kind of, um, as well as. Um, you know, sort of uh, even sort of visionary stories too, um, and then you have woe statements too. Woe to you, you know. Um, so that'd be one way through words to communicate God's revelation. You can also do it through actions. Um, I call it here street theater. You can see this in Ezekiel over and over again. He does all sorts of things that um, are meant to provoke thought. What does this mean? You can do it through protests. There's different. Uh, ways in which the prof prophets uh, act in ways that we might call civil disobedience. Um, and then you can use symbolic behavior, you know. Um, so, uh, you know, different prophets. Um, Isaiah walks through the streets naked, you know, what's that all, all about? Uh, oftentimes we see how, how the prophets name their children, that tells us something. Poor kids have to bear these sort of uh, heavy names throughout life. Uh, uh, but anyway, the naming of the prophet's own children uh, oftentimes is meant to be revelatory. And then through liturgical rites, there's, uh, we shouldn't forget that much of, pro of prophetic literature uh, was composed within uh, the cult, within the temple context. And so therefore, the use of liturgical uh, rites or imagery is used often. Uh, so... Um, what might we say about uh, the, is the modern relevance of the prophets? If you want to, you can go to this little YouTube and do a little social analysis about what, where are we as a world, but before we go, let you do that on your own. But um, I'd say, uh, first off, we're trying to think about what relevance is there of the biblical text. The first thing we need to do is read them through the lens of historical context. We can greatly uh, uh, misuse prophetic tradition if we don't look at the context, and particularly the historical context in which these books were written. Uh, that's going to be very important. And then as we've emphasized in the past, we got to look at genre, the literary genre, and particularly the forms. And in class, we're going to spend a lot of time uh, trying to dissect and understand the, liter the literary forms um, and what they might signify for us. So we have to pay attention to, to that too. So, you know, uh, a vision has a certain literary function and purpose, and if it's just taken, you know, used in a manner inconsistent with that purpose and function, then that's a problem. Um, also, we should note that all the biblical books, almost all of them, uh, have some sort of composite nature to them. Um, you know, they seem to have been written over a period of time, or at least there's some sort of composite nature in terms of different pieces coming together. So we can imagine that the final books are more the work of editors and not the works of the prophet themselves. Uh, and this is important, right? Uh, to understand how the books before us have a literary history in terms of their composition. Uh, so if we're going to properly understand how uh, to apply them today, we have to be aware of that. So um, this is from a, a scholar named Tucker. When he tried to identify some of the modern relevance of the prophets. He says it gives us a sense of vocation. You know, how do we respond to God? And what's our responsibility to and for the world? 
that's really what they call us to. You know, there's that great um, Emil Bucher line that what is vocation? It's where your great passion and the world's great need meet. Right? Your great passion and the world's great need meet. Um, and so this is what the, the prophets are. They're people that look, have this passionate love and desire for faithfulness to God. And they look upon the needs of the world and they articulate how those are meeting and how we are called to greater faithfulness in order to respond to that to that need within the world. Um, the other relevance of the prophets for us today is that they give us a sense of the power of human words and symbolic actions to change the world. You know, that uh, uh, we can get kind of overwhelmed that we can't change anything and and the prophets kind of uh, indicate to us that words matter, actions matter, that in fact we can affect change and make a difference in the world. And then um, there's sort of this deep awareness of the historical concreteness of living the spiritual life. You know, again, it, you know, maybe one of the disturbing features of that study that I saw from Baylor is, uh, particularly with the Catholic numbers, is the sense that God was fairly distant, right, not very active with daily life. Um, even though I try to critique it a bit uh, in terms of did the, the, the researchers pick up the sacramental language, I, I'm not so sure it's all wrong, you know, the, the, the conclusions of that study. I do think um, maybe Catholics have a less sense of the immediacy of God's presence in their spiritual life. So the prophets call us to that sort of awareness of God's action, and, and God's action not just in our personal life, but on a broader scope, you know, there's a phrase here, historical concreteness, you know, that God is involved with human history. And then the um, fourth uh, relevant point that the prophets can bring home to us is that it, it gives us a sense of the social, corporate, and institutional dimensions of human life, you know, that uh, calls us to recognize that we are bound together and, and that we are fundamentally social beings. And that uh, it's just not God and me, you know, but God and we. And so uh, the prophets are always talking about nations, not individuals. Uh, if they call out individuals, they're usually um, people in power because they've separated themselves from the people. And that's why they're being critiqued. Um, and they don't see themselves properly oriented within the social fabric and in terms of relationship to, with God. So, and then finally, the fifth um, kind of major value of the prophets for us today is their sense of moral decisiveness you know that um, you gotta kind of fish and cut bait now you gotta make a decision you know sort of this calling to authenticity um, you know instead of sort of smoothing off all the edges uh, trying to be fully flowering as who and what we are and how we're created as, as human beings by God so um, if you got any muddiest points as we went through this, please bring them to uh, class so we can talk about them. I'm happy to clarify them in class. And in class we will um, focus on Amos and use him to articulate the different uh, prophetic forms. And then we'll also look at Haggai uh, as well to try as sort of a counterpoint to uh, uh, Amos. Amos is more of a social justice prophet. Haggai is more of focused on right worship. All right, so we'll see you on Monday.